Um, I remember clearly some mile markers in my life. There are certain things that as I grew up, there were cer there are certain mile markers of when I went to middle school. I remember I was, um, I was a late bloomer when it came to my height. So I was about maybe 4'10", 4 4'9", 4 going into middle school, and I was nervous about it because, like, I was tiny, you know. I had a crazy growth spurt uh, for, for an Asian guy. Uh, crazy growth spurt right when I got in there. But um, I remember that mile marker. I remember getting into high school, but I remember getting my license. Man, I remember the, when I got my license. It was like a badge of honor for for. I mean, like at 15 and a half, I started doing uh, driver's ed, started getting my driver's permit. I was just getting ready because on my birthday was when I was going to go get my driver's license. You know, that was, it was, it was not just the terrible car I had. It was the freedom, you know, because the car was a piece of junk. But the freedom was amazing. And right when I turned 16, the taste of freedom had me yearning for when I was going to turn 18. No more rules, no more getting home by this time. I was going to leave, go to college, make my own rules, make my own decision, be my own man. It was, a, it was stepping into adulthood. But something funny lately, I've been hearing from parents with kids who are turning 16 and 18. They're saying, man, my kid don't want to drive. They don't want their license. It's like they're now 18, 19 years old. It's like, when are you going to get your license? And it's like, I, I don't want to drive. And it's so weird for me to completely put it together because all of us, every single person I knew in high school was, was begging for their license, you know. They couldn't wait for it because I think, I, I think it's something where, like, it's so easy to connect at home now. In your room, you're connecting with everyone, all this technology. You don't need to go anywhere and feel plugged in any, anymore. Back then, if you didn't go out, you're, like, turning on the TV and changing the channel. Okay, not like that. Not like that. I did have a TV like that when I was younger, though, but not when I was in high school, right? Um, but there's, there's this lack of need for that. And if anything, as they go to college, they want to stay local. They really don't want to move out. Like, they, they know that when 20 comes around, 21 comes around, this word adulting becomes real scary. Because with the freedom also comes with the rent. Like, all of a sudden, if I didn't buy groceries, I stay hungry. Like, wait, food just doesn't appear in my fridge like it used to? Like, well, there's food or gas these days, where we, which we all are short. Like, I don't know about you guys. I leave my gas light on a little longer than usual these days. <laughs> Maybe the gas will go down tomorrow. I'm like, no. But if I don't pump it, I'm not going anywhere. So when it comes to adulting, there's this season of trying to learn how, how to do life, how to, uh, to be an adult. And so there's this book. I reference this book all the time. It's by Bob Beale called De uh, Decade by Decade. And what he talks about is in every decade of our life, there is this word, this core thing that we're after. And so from birth to 10, the word is security. He said children, they, they need security. They, they, they need to know that food will be there when they're hungry. They need to know that uh, there's shelter. They need to know that there's security for them in their teenage years. So from 11 to 20, the word is self. This is their selfish years, you know. You might be saying, yeah, my teenager is selfish. You were a teenager at one time. Okay. And this is the years that you got to reconcile all of your thoughts, all of your ideas. It's all about you. It's all about your looks, your reputation, your thing, like uh, your, your artistry or your freedom to express yourself. Everything is you, so it's the selfish years. In your 20s, the word is survival. And so adulting is about survival. Adulting is learning how to get things done and all of a sudden move into a state of dependency into independence. And so when you turn 20, there's a rude awakening. There's a, wait. I want to do my laundry, but where's the detergent? <laughs> but did you buy the detergent? So you're kind of 
you're kind of tripping and stumbling your way through your 20s. And as you turn 23, 25, 27, you start to get a hang of the survival. You start to get good practices under your belt. Create budgets for your life. Still, you start to do some good practices in your life. because, And there's this saying that becomes concrete more in your 20s. This is a saying that says, uh, if you want it done right, you got to do it yourself. In your 20s, that's when you learn that. In your 20s, it's like, if I don't do it myself, it ain't going to get done. And so it is a weird thing. It is a, it's a backwards thing. When you show up to church and a pastor on stage all of a sudden says, you got to depend on God. He's your provider. Well, your entire life, for the last decade, you've been learning how to be independent. And when you come to the church, it says, no, God doesn't want you to be independent. He wants you to be dependent on him. And it gets backwards. It gets twisted. And the moment that you're always thinking that it's on you, he's saying, no, 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 come lean on me. So the truth is it's hard. It's difficult to uh, imagine a God that sometimes seems so intangible that you can actually offer real problems. You know, I, you, He's so intangible. I can't see him. I can't. What's he going to do? And so it's difficult for us to do that. But hopefully after this sermon, you can really start understanding that God is really capable, really able to handle all of your tangible problems. Now, some of you are like, "Mm -mm." (laughs) mm-mm. I'm not so sure about that. But if you really want to learn how to lean on God as the provider in your life, you got to start out with building trust with him. And how God does this is through the trust test. In uh, verse 5, it says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for the, these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. Only to test him. There are certain times in my life when difficulties come, I'm like, God. Are you testing me right now? I mean, there's certain people who test me, like my four-year-old, he tests me all the time. And I tell him, Canaan, I'm about to pass this test. <laughs> but when a God is testing me, it's like, man, what am I supposed to learn? Why is this difficulty? Why can't you just fix this for me? What is going on? Why? Why me, God? Why, what is going on with this? But there is a test. And here's the kicker. In verse 6, he finishes it off. He says, for he, Jesus, already had in mind what he was going to do. So when facing this impossible situation that he was asking Philip to do, he already had in mind what he was going to do. So whatever challenge that you're currently going through, whatever difficulty that you're going through, as uh, as much as the 25,000 people that you are supposed to feed with five rolls, two, two fish, That impossible situation, God already has a plan. He already has a plan on what he was going to do in your life. In Jeremiah, it says plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So this, when you're facing situations that feels like a test, how do you respond? When life is going to rough things, how do you respond? Um, I'm a big fan of Steve Carell. Anybody a fan of Steve Carell? Okay. He's, he's the guy in the office. All right. uh, I don't get to watch TV much, but Pastor Jared loves the office. And so whenever I'm sitting with him, he's playing the office in the background. And every time he turns it on, I'm like glued to it. I'm laughing every 30 seconds because Steve Carell, he's hilarious. He's a genius. And so there was a movie a few years back that he came out with called uh, Evan Almighty. Evan Almighty. I think it's a hilarious movie. If you haven't seen it, Evan, Evan, which Steve Carell, Evan Baxter uh, relives the, uh, I'm sorry, the Noah story. So God is showing up, telling him to build this boat, and he's doing this thing. And it's wild because uh, there's this giant boat outside of his house, and people are wondering what's going on. And, and in the middle of the process, his wife, his wife, Joan Baxter, is just looking at him like he's crazy. Now, she's been praying for all of these things in her household, in her family, in her marriage. But he's looking at her husband, and he's just like, she's just like, man, this man is straight crazy. And so there was a scene in this movie that I would never forget. Um, Morgan Freeman, who plays God in the movie, but his voice really sounds like what God's voice (laughs) would sound like. 
because, man, <laughs> he sounds heavenly with his voice, right? So soothing and full of, like, wisdom. I wish I preached, like, how he sounds. But um, there was this scene. He shows up to a bar. His wife, um, or Joan's, Joan Baxter, Evan's wife, is sitting at the bar. She's distraught. She's She's like had enough. She doesn't know how to handle this situation. Her, her husband is just flown off the cuckoo's nest, and all of a sudden, like she's so disconnected with him. And Morgan Freeman says this. He says, do you think when people pray for patience, does God give them patience or give them an opportunity to be patient? He says, when, when, God, when people pray to God to give them courage, does God give them courage or opportunities to be courageous? And then he seeks right into Joan Baxter's life. And she's been praying for her family to, be, family to be closer. And so he says, when people pray for their family to be closer, do peop, does he just give them warm and fuzzy feelings or opportunities to love one another? And I will never forget that scene, but coming back... It's like if you've been praying for a sign, does God show up with a sign or an opportunity for you to show faith? An opportunity for you to step in and say, God, I want this sign. So he gives you the opportunities to be full of faith with him. You've been praying to get closer with God. Has he shown you the opportunities to step in with faith? Because faith is the currency of heaven. Like that's his goal. With you, whatever you ask him for, faith is his goal to put in you. That's the currency of heaven. That's how he is pleased. In, in um, Hebrews eleven six, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so God is trying to teach you how to step in with faith more and more, with every sign that you're praying for, with every situation that you're pleading him for. He says, here's the opportunity to step in with faith. And so that's the... Trust test. And if you want to really start learning how to lean on God for provision, you got to start learning how to trust him. you got to pass this trust test. But you also got to know that in your situation, the impossible situation, the five loaves, two fish, 25,000 people situation in your life, that God will put the super on your natural. So in verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of uh, grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same thing with the fish. The natural was the impossibility. The 25,000 people, and this is all I have, that was the natural. But when I'm partnered with Jesus, he puts the super in that natural. God takes the scraps and put his stamps on it. He takes our scraps and he says, I'm with you. It may have been, I'm telling you, it will probably have been way more epic if Jesus, instead of taking the loaves and the fish and then multiplying it and feeding the people, what if the rocks around them just kind of bloop, 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 all of a sudden turn into bread, you know? And the grass around them turned into little fish that was already cooked and perfect amount of rub and seasoning and lemon. And he could have done that, y'all. He could have done that. The, the God that could speak stars into existence could have done that. He could have done exactly, like just make manna come out of the sky. He could have done that. But there's something that he does on a regular basis in the Bible is he wants to partner with your faith. When it seems like the thing you have natural in your hand is impossible to handle the situation, he wants to see you step into it, even with fear, even with timidity. Can you imagine if you were the disciple and trying to seat the 25,000 people in groups of 50? Okay, that, that alone is a miracle because <laughs> it's hard enough to get 200 people to come to church on time. You know what I'm saying? People in the back. I'm not talking about y'all. <laughs> but here it is. If you were the disciples and you've sat them down and here's your basket and you have these five rolls and you have these two uh, fish strips and, and you're walking towards and he says, go, go feed them. 
Go feed them. This, this account happened in all four Gospels, so then you can piece other things together as the disciples are coming to them. The Bible says that take all you want, but here, all you want is one person's worth. I could eat five loaves of bread and, and two fish. And I can only imagine how nervous they were when they came to the first person and said, hey, will you, can you just take a little bit? Because you're looking at the multitude. And you're, I could barely feed the 200 people here, let alone if I had that much. How nervous would I be? But at the end of it all, God puts his super on your natural. Um, if you've been to Growth Track, anybody been to Growth Track? All right. If you call E2 your home, you need, to be, you need to go through Growth Track. Because in the middle of this process in Growth Track, you learn what our church is about, what we believe, and, and um, ways you can get involved, ways more about you, how to activate your call. But we also talk about this story of how um, Lisa and I, we moved to Charlotte. That's where we met Pastor Jared. And then coming back and, and getting together, and eventually the church is born, right? But the story actually began about six months before I moved to Charlotte. Because a decision had to be made. During that time, all of a sudden, there were a few multiple encounters that kind of gave me this idea that I'm supposed to move across country. Now, at this time, I had a business, I had a home, I had a wife with a job, I had all my family here, all my wife's, uh, wife's family here, wives, no, <laughs> wife's, wives, the apostrophe, apostrophe yes, okay, possessive. Whew. I'm glad she was here for the nine, you know. <laughs> but they were all here, and it was, it was difficult to even imagine the role, the, the responsibility to say, we're going to uproot and move across country. There was a lot of pieces involved. So instantly, my reaction as God was putting this crazy idea of following his call, my first reaction was, uh -uh, not me. Uh, you crazy about that. And then another person told me about the opportunity. And then another person encouraged me on this opportunity. And, to, and each time I would say, no, that's, that's impossible. We can't do that. We can't do that. I had a business. But it wasn't until the behind the scenes, my business partner came to me out of nowhere. He heard about the opportunity. He said, he said what you're about to go do, I want to do, but I can't. So I'm going to hold down this business so you can go do that. I was like, nah, bro, <laughs> you don't got to do that. You ain't holding down nothing. I ain't going nowhere. In the background, Lisa was, was looking at other jobs, specifically a remote position, so that when the time came, we would be available. There wouldn't be hindrances for us to move forward. And I didn't even know that that was the reason why, but all of a sudden, one day she says, hey, if God is calling you to do this, you got to know that you're not doing this alone. We're doing this together. We are sacrificing together. We are stepping out. We are moving together. And it's so powerful when there's people around you that says, the thing you thought was your responsibility, your weight to make this decision on your own, we are doing it together. Now, some of you might say, I don't have a business partner like that. If anything, they were opposite of that. And I don't have a wife like that right now. But in verse 5, it says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall you buy bread for these people to eat? He didn't say that. He said, where shall we buy bread? When you're faced with the impossible situation, does your mind instantly go to a place, what am I going to do about that? How do I get half a year's wage to buy bread for all of these people? Or am I partnered with Jesus to say, hey, I know my situation, but with Jesus, partnered with the one who can make anything happen, that is when I can start trusting God. That is when I can start seeing breakthrough." If your marriage is in a place where you can barely, you can barely say two words with one another without fighting. Trust me, I was there. Do you say, what do I need to do to fix this? What do I need to do to help our communication? Or are you hearing Jesus says, what are we going to do about your marriage? When your bank account is, is so bare that you can't even pay next month's rent, are you hearing Jesus say, what are we going to do about this? Or do you instantly go to a place, I got to hustle, I got to I gotta bend my integrity, I got to do all of these things because it's all on my shoulder, or do you partner with the God 
that has done it before in your life. Because the thing that is in common with your current impossible situation is your previous impossible situation. And the previous impossible situation before that. We've walked through so many impossible situations. And even if we didn't seek God out, did you know that God made it happen anyway? As much as Philip didn't think about it, God still fed the people. God still made the impossible happen even when you specifically couldn't see it. So it's hard to see God play a role in your current situation. But it helps when you're able to reflect on the old impossibilities and how he showed up there. When I was able to connect the pieces in my life in retrospect, in hindsight, that was when I was so clear of God's uh, presence in all of my problems, God's presence in all of my situations. He's asking you today, what are we going to do about your trial, your difficulty, your season? What are we going to do about it? Are you going to invite him in or do you stay cynical? God has five loaves, two fish. I can't do nothing with this. That was easy to respond. That was an easy thing to respond. I'm seeing 25,000 people in this basket. I could have threw it back in Jesus' face and said, you really want me to go out there and make a fool of myself? So in your situation, we see the impossibility. Are you willing to step each way, doubting? The weak faith that he is saying, oh, my gosh, he's stepping at me even when he's scared of me, even when it seems hopeless, he's still stepping towards me and willing to take these steps. This is the, the faith that God is after in your life. Believing God to be your provider doesn't happen through wishful thinking. It happens through the, the intentional way of building trust with God and knowing, knowing that although your natural is not enough, God puts his super on that. But at the end of the day is this. Whatever you pray for, whatever sign that you're wishing for, you got to know that the source is greater than the supply. Whatever you're praying for, if he can make it happen, it would be small in comparison with the person of Jesus Christ. So a few verses down after, after the feeding of the multitude, people are still following him. Starting in verse 30, they st- They keep on going after him, and they're still doubting and still not believing. And this is what they say. In verse 30, it says, so they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? After they've seen all of these signs, remember, he's been on a miracle tour, and they're still coming back. What are you going to do so we can see it and we can believe? It goes on, he says, our ancestors, he's talking about Moses, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it was written. He gave them bread from heaven to, uh, from heaven to eat. And Jesus corrected him. He's like, it wasn't Moses. It was my father in heaven that did that. He made sure that they know that Moses was just a man delivering what God was promising them. And so they responded snarkily. I, I read it that way. And it was like, sir, they said, always give us that bread then. Because Moses did that one. Give me that bread then so I could believe you. And Jesus responds in this way. He says, you want that bread? He says, declare it, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. You want that bread? Here I am. Believe it or not, here I am. In my uh, early 20s, I was, um, I was a wreck. Like some people are like, oh, I can't believe that. Yes, I was a wreck. Okay. My whole goal in life was to work Monday through Friday so I could support my nightlife Thursday through Saturday. Every dollar, y'all, gas, what? It didn't go to gas. Gas was cheaper then. It went to, it went to a lot of um, um, other things. Man, I was in the club. I was drinking, partying all the time. I was chasing girls. This was my life in my early 20s. And that was my goal, living my best life now. 
I mean, when I think about it, I must have. In the season of learning how to survive, I must have said, there's something empty here. And that I just needed something to fill my heart, fill something so that I could feel a sense of purpose or sense of fulfillment or satisfaction. And so I did that. In my, um, about 20 years ago now, gosh. Now, when you start, when you could start saying 20 years ago and you were still an adult, you know. About 20 years ago, my college roommate, Billy, he invited me onto a snowboarding trip. And uh, I asked him a little bit about the trip, and he told me, yeah, it's going to be dope. Um, we get picked up in the morning by this party bus. Like, you get on, they drive you to Sierra. And on the ride, they're, like, bringing buckets of beers around and drinks around and things like that. And you get up, you get onto the mountains, you, you go snowboarding, you come back, and it's a party bus ride back, you know? Come beat it. It sounded like heaven to me. I said, I'm in. I'm in. So we, on the day of, on the Saturday morning, uh, we get to the bus. We get, get all checked in with all of our stuff. And, and um, I start handing me the Coronas. You know, I started drinking all these Coronas. And, and Billy, um, a couple of years ago, he got into some, some trouble. And in the middle of that, he, he found Jesus. So he is now a born-again Christian, you know. And so while... I was drinking my Coronas, he was telling me about Jesus. And he was telling me about the Bible, apologetics, like science, and all of that fun stuff. And he was telling me all of these things. And, and in my mind, I was thinking, I, I wasn't annoyed by it. I wanted to prove him wrong. I wanted to make his faith sound stupid. And so some of the arguments, I know he had a little bit of credibility to it, but some of the arguments were just terrible, you know. Like God created the world because monkeys don't turn into humans anymore, you know. And I'm like, Come on, brother. But we do that trip. We get up onto the mountain. We snowboard for a couple of hours. Then we go back into the lodge, and we're having our chili and our snacks. And, and like, man, he goes again. He starts talking about Jesus, and we talk about the Bible and Jesus pretty much the whole trip. We get on the boat ride. I mean, I'm sorry, the boat ride. The, the bus ride back. Man, I'm slipping a couple times today. The bus ride back, and, um, and he's, we're still talking about this. And the guy with the bucket came by. I grabbed the fresh Corona. I popped open this Corona. And Billy, see, he didn't drink. And so he's probably had two beers in his whole life at this time, you know. And I said, bro, you down this, I'll come to a Bible study. And he did not, like, he did not say, are you sure? You promise? Like, you, will you sign this? He, he grabbed the beer, chugged it all down. He chugged that beer like, I was like, are you sure you don't drink, bro? <laughs> he chugged, he chugged, and that's how it all started. I showed up to a Bible study. And so you might have shown up today because somebody bribed you to, for lunch or they said, Easter's coming up, and you thought it was this week, and you just, Everything changed. I showed up to that Bible study, and it felt like the word, the thing we studied was exactly, exactly towards me. It felt like the Bible study leader was specifically speaking to me, even though there was a group of people around. I swear he was looking at me, though. Like, it felt like everything was in that way. And I left, I left that night saying, God, I might have judged you beforehand. I might have had a little bit of preconceptions in my mind of who you are without truly understanding you. So what I'm going to do, I'll make a deal that I will go after learning about who you are. And when you meet Jesus and you truly go after who he is, you can't help but to fall in love with him. There's people have learned about Jesus to try to disprove the Bible that fell in love with Christ. They got saved in the process. When everything started changing. It, it was slow. It was a process, you know, slow steps, slow, slow, timid walks, There's still some doubts, but I started falling in love with Christ. And I'll tell you this, I used to pray for some, some silly things, you know, God, let me win the lottery. You know? It's only funny because you did it too. 
God, let me find the girl of my dreams. And my favorite, my favorite prayer all the time, God, I'll give up everything. I'll give up everything if you give me a parking spot at Sac State, you know. I'm late for my class, and, like, I'm still waiting for somebody to come out. And it's like, God, just give me a sign that you are real. After I met Jesus, though, like, after I really fell in love with him, all of my desires and prayers, all of the things, because I still ask for things. I still pray for things. I pray that he align my heart with his, but man, my heart wants stuff. And I still pray for these things, but can I tell you, they are way secondary to the person of Jesus Christ. They are way, way secondary to my relationship, my desire, me wanting to be with Christ. There was this song that used to say, this, this line that Paul used to say. He says, to die, oh, I'm sorry, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I used to hear this song, and it just didn't resonate with me that well. And if you guys know, Paul, like, Paul, he was persecuted, executing Christians. He was, like, completely on the other end of the spectrum. Now he's at a point where he says, as long as I have breath in my lungs, Jesus, you are it. Christ, you are it. That is so much on a different level than everything else I want. He says, to live is Christ. And he says, and to die... So it's a game. When you start falling in love with God, God starts shifting your desires and understanding of that. Because I know it might be hard right now. But I can tell you right now, I, I would, I'm not nowhere close to the businessman that I want to wanna be. I'm no, nowhere close to the pastor I want to be, the leader I want to be. I'm not even close to anything in that way. But there's a contentment in my heart that cannot be replaced with anything that the world can offer me. That means that I would not trade in my relationship with God, my encounter with Christ. I would not trade that in with any amount of money, success, comfort, influence, power. It doesn't matter. I wouldn't trade it in. And I'm not saying that because I have to. There's, I've seen people with more money. I've seen people with more power. There's a contentment that exists, a satisfaction that exists when you know your relationship with God is tied. Because Jesus is the bread of life. He's the bread of life. Whatever, you might be hungry, so you need some bread in your life. Or the trials got you thirsty, running in circles. But the truth is, it says it clearly. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 